Well, hello everyone. Thank you for joining us today for our discussion about our new Doxin Plus Fire Ant Bait. I'm Heather Patterson, Technical Services Manager at Control Solutions, Inc. And uh, this is a product that we did launch earlier this year, and we're going to go over what it is and how to use it. We'll also go into why fire ants are important to control, what other ant species this product is labeled for, and then we're going to look at some of the results and uh, efficacy data that we got while performing field and lab trials with Dachshund Plus Fire Ant Bait. So the first question we're going to jump into is why bait for fire ants? What value does this bring to our ant management strategy and service? Well, most of us are familiar with and understand the reasons why we must manage fire ants. Um, I'm, I'm tuning in from Texas today, and according to the Texas A&M Imported Fire Ant Research Program, the impact that red imported fire ants cause is estimated to be over $1 billion annually every year just in the state of Texas alone. Of course, their stings are painful. Their venom is going to be an issue. You know, it's different than bee and wasp venom. Um, fire ant venom contains 95% water and soluble alkaloids, and it's those water and soluble alkaloids that cause that nasty signature white pustule to form that we see in the picture on the left-hand side. If you're from the South, and I'm willing to bet that you are, you've adorned one or two of these before in your lifetime. And when it comes to the mounds, the mere sight of them will quickly discourage turf, uh, turf grass activities. You know, more than just a landscape nuisance, they're a recreational nuisance. You know, people, family, children, tourists, golfers, other athletes. You know, we want to be able to enjoy our residential and community and commercial turf grass areas free of these mounds and free of their inhabitants. So the EPA um, does classify fire ants as a pest of significant public health importance. In the EPA, the Environmental Protection Agency, they have a list of all the pests that are classified as significant pests of public health importance and all the ones that you'd expect to be there are there, of course. Mosquitoes and ticks because um, they transmit you know, disease-causing organisms and pathogens, German cockroaches because they mechanically transmit disease-causing pathogens and they, they produce really potent allergens. And so what we're looking at here is a snip from that list of the Hymenopterans, and Hymenoptera is the insect order that contains the stinging insects, so all the bees, wasps, and ant species roll up into the order Hymenoptera. And this list is going to be broken into three columns, as you can see. The column on the left is the common name of the insects. Uh, the middle is going to be the scientific name because sometimes the common names can be uh, variable from place to place or region to region, depending on what part of the country you're in. And then the third column at the end is, is the reason why this particular pest is considered a public health pest. And in the case of, of um, stinging insects like fire ants, it's because they do have painful stings, and their venom can cause allergic reactions. Now, generally speaking, most people are going to experience some type of uh, mild discomfort, swelling, um, an itchy bump that follows a fire ant sting that'll eventually go away. But on some rare occasions, you know, their stings can cause anaphylaxis, which is a severe and potentially life-threatening reaction. Okay, and so I think it's also important to know that our sensitivities and reactions to, to various compounds, whether we're talking about food or pollen or latex or insect venom, our sensitivities can change throughout our lifetime. You know, some, just because it wasn't something that previously caused a reaction doesn't mean it won't cause a reaction in the future. Uh, take for instance, you know, when I was a grad student, one of my lab mates, he helped me with one of my field trials, and it was in this pasture where we're, there was a lot of fire ant mounds, and we both got stung while we did our, our field trial observations, which it was nothing. You know, we've, you live in Florida, you kind of deal with fire ants, it's just the reality. And he had come from the pest control industry. He did that work for many years before he decided to come back to school to get his degree in entomology. And so we were both shocked when we got back to the lab and his face had swollen up like a balloon and his eyes were so tiny and squinty. And we knew that he was having an allergic reaction to the fire ant stings and we rushed him to the ER to get treatment. And so it's important to be aware of that, whether it's yourself or somebody else who gets stung by a stinging insect. You know, sometimes the reactions can be delayed, but regardless, you want to keep an eye on that person, an eye on yourself, and then seek medical attention if you do end up having that type of, of allergic reaction. I digress. 
I want to get back to the list here. It's important to know too, as, as consumers and users and customers that, that use these products, you know, if a manufacturer wants to include a pest on their newly registered product, take for instance, Doxin Plus Fire Ant Bait in this case, and, and Fire Ants, which we know are public health pests, the EPA does require performance data that, data that demonstrates that this product actually is going to kill and control the public health pest. And these are gonna be restringent, stringent efficacy standards from the EPA that in many cases, it's gonna take years to produce. It's all part of the development process, but it does have to demonstrate that it is effective against any public health pest. So going back to the question, why bait for fire ants? Another advantage is that these products do the work. Doxin Plus Fire Ant Bait was developed to be attractive to fire ants. And so those foragers are gonna actively seek out the bait granules. They're gonna bring them back to the colony, share them with the rest of the nest. And so since this bait is formulated with multiple active ingredients that are considered to be slower acting, which means that they're not going to deliver instantaneous kill after exposure, that allows the time for the product to work its way through the nest, affecting other individuals and even the queen through trophallaxis. Ants are social insects, as we know. This means that there's going to be reproductive division of labor. You have your fertile individuals in the colony, AKA the queen or queens, because fire ants can be monogyne or polygyne. We're gonna get into that in the coming slides. You know, she's gonna be focused on and busy making and laying eggs while her offspring, the workers, they're gonna be focused on caring for the brood, caring for the queen, building, expanding and defending the nest, and of course, foraging for food. Those foragers are tasked with the important job of, of feeding everybody else back at the nest. And they accomplish this uh, by trophallaxis, which is that sharing of food, sharing of nutrients between two individuals. And in the case of Doxin plus fire ant bait, the food that they're sharing is poisoned and none of them even know it. The goal with an integrated pest management program is to suppress fire ants. Right? We have very effective control methods, options, and strategies to get that job done. So what are some of those methods? Well, broadcasting a bait allows for greater area coverage and targets those smaller colonies that may not have mounds that are visible yet. We've got residual contact insecticides that get applied to the grass. Those are also going to be very effective, such as you know granular products, for instance, that contain fipronil, such as our fipronil granules. Those are gonna be considered to be um, slower acting, but they will provide a longer lasting residual. There's also faster acting products, options labeled for fire ants, including our Bifen LP, for instance. That's gonna be a faster acting product option. And then also you have individual mound treatments. That's a method that is going to be suitable for you know, treating smaller areas that have fewer mounds. And there's several types of products that can be used to do that. Um, it can be applied as a liquid drench, for instance, injectable aerosols, dusts, and even granules that need to get watered in. When I moved to Houston a few years ago, I learned about the Texas Two-Step from Texas A&M University, which is touted as the best proven approach to effectively manage fire ants. The Texas two-step includes broadcasting an insecticidal bait, recommended sometime in late summer, early fall time period, and then treating individual problem mounds uh, uh, when they pop up with an approved mound drench, a granular bait, or dust insecticide product. Okay, now that we got a little bit of that Fire Ant 101 out of the way, I want to shift gears and focus more on Doxin Plus Fire Ant Bait specifically. So what exactly is Doxin Plus? It's a brand new innovative fire ant solution from CSI. It's a ready to use formulation. It works very well to manage difficult ant populations and can be used to control them on a number of sites. And we're gonna take a look at a more comprehensive list of what those approved sites are in the coming slides. So this is um, what the bait granules look like, a sample image to give you a sense of the appearance of Doxin Plus. Very yellow coloration, has a moderately sweet odor, and the particle size is going to range from 0.84 to 2 millimeters. And so when you think about um, a fire ant colony, those workers are going to be um, different sizes. You have minor workers that are going to be smaller and larger workers and so we'll take a look at uh, some pictures of different sizes workers but the smaller ones are going to be able to um, more easily pick up those smaller bits while the larger ones can take away those you know larger granules that are going to be you know two millimeters in length or so so why is it a good choice 
to manage fire ants. Well, we generated an abundant amount of data for this product before launching it, and the results of its performance showed that Dachshund Plus starts killing fire ants faster um, than, than other fire ant baits on the market, achieving 90% control by day two versus day five for the industry standard used in the trial. It also delivered season-long control. One application of Dachshund Plus fire ant bait killed the queen, killed the colony, and controlled the ants for three months. Applications of this product resulted in fire ant free lawns and no new mounts for 90 days after application. Dachshund Plus fire ant bait contains three active ingredients. We're going to take a look at how they're grouped according to IRAC. IRAC is the Insecticide Resistance Action Committee, and they work um, active ingredients into specific groups based on their mode of action. The color scheme they use associates modes of action into broad categories based on the physiological functions affected within the insect. Um, and, and aid to understanding symptomology, the speed of action, as well as other properties associated with the active ingredient. Doxin Plus contains 0.045% endoxicarb. IRAC categorizes this active ingredient in a blue group, which indicates that it affects the insect's nervous system. 0.01% pyroproxifen, and green groupings represent active ingredients that affect insect's growth and development and 0.01% novoloron, which is an active ingredient that also affects insect growth and development. You can see that these colored groups, um, they have uh, these boxes that contain multiple active ingredients within that one box. For instance, pyroproxifen and phenoxycarb are in the same group seven together because they're both juvenile hormone mimics. They do have their own unique molecular structure, but if since they are in the same box, they're going to affect the insect in a very similar way, the same way at the same target site. And Doxycar belongs to the oxidizing chemical class, that's IREC group 22. Its insecticidal activity occurs by uh, blocking sodium channels in the insect's nervous system. And the mode of entry for endoxicarb uh, is going to be via um, ingestion and contact routes. Pyroproxifen is an IREC group 7, the juvenile hormone analogs. Pyroproxifen is an IGR, insect growth re regulator that is mimicking a natural hormone within the insects that they naturally produce. And pyroproxifen is going to disrupt the insect's growth. You know, there are critical growth events that insects undergo, and they require natural juvenile hormone levels to be very low at those growth events so that the insect can de develop their adult features. That includes wings, their reproductive organs. Well, by introducing pyroproxifen to these juvenile insects, they're exposed to hormone mimics at a time when they're not supposed to be there, when those hormone levels are supposed to be very, very low. So we're forcing detrimental hormonal mix signaling within the insect, and it can prevent those young insects from growing into healthy, normal, fertile adults. The mode of entry for pyroproxifen is also, like endoxicarb, going to be via ingestion or contact. And then we have Novoluron, which is a powerful insect growth regulator. We find it in IRAC group 15, the benzyl ureas. And insects are going to depend on proper chitin synthesis in order to form their exoskeleton, right? The healthy exoskeleton is critical for survival in insects. And so by inhibiting and interfering with that process of producing chitin, um, it's going to end up resulting in abortive molts and death. And that's how Novoluron works. Like the other two active ingredients, it also is effective through ingestion as well as contact. Now, entomologists and researchers have shown that IGRs have demonstrated activity in a number of, of pests that we face in, in pest management, including fire ants, by reducing egg production, preventing worker development. You know, the immature stage is really at risk, of course, when we, with the use of insect growth regulators. And we know that for ants, the, the immature group, they are going to be the digestive system for the colony. Foragers are going to uh, bring back the solid food particles, the baked granules, and they give it to the larvae to break down. And once it's been liquefied, the adults are going to feed on those liquids produced by the larvae, which have ingested insect growth regulators that are going to result in their demise. 
Now this is an illustration on how bait is gathered, how it's brought back to the colony, and how it affects the others in the nest. You can see it makes its way all the way to the queen. And as you'd expect, all three active ingredients that I mentioned, endoxicarb, nofaluron, and pyroproxifen, they're all non-propellant active ingredients. That's a really important characteristic for a bait, right? That means the workers are going to forage as normal, they're going to collect the particles that pass the check as a perfect food source, and they're not going to have any idea that there's or are not going to be able to detect that there's anything suspicious or any active ingredient on these particles. Now, Dachshund Plus Fire Ant Bait is currently available in two package size options. We offer it in a 25 pound bag, as well as a four pound jug with a handle. Next, we're gonna talk about the listed ants that uh, this product controls. Dachshund Plus Fire Ant Bait is labeled for the control of imported fire ants, in the genus Solenopsis, big-headed ants in the genus Fidoli, pavement ants in Tetramorium, and turf grass ants like Lassius neoniger. You can see that three of the four have asterisks, and that indicates that the product is not approved for use on those ants in the state of California. This isn't a one-stop solution for every species of ants, but it is shown to be effective on the ones listed here. There are several species of fire ants, but red imported fire ants are arguably the most notorious. Uh, Solenopsis geminata, which is the tropical fire ant, that can be found uh, commonly um, throughout the southern United States, and that's probably the most common native fire ant species encountered. And to the untrained eye, um, the tropical fire ant is going to look almost identical to red imported fire ants, and they build mounds that look quite similar as well. There are two genetically distinct forms of the red imported fire ant. You have the single queen or monogyne form, and then you have the multi-queen or polygyne form. And those polygyne forms can have mound densities of greater than you know, 300 mounds per acre and more ants of, per acre, of course, compared to the single queen forms. What are they feeding on? Well, these ants are gonna be omnivorous. They're feeding on various carbohydrate and protein sources. And we know that their mounds are going to be quite characteristic and not have a central entrance hole or opening like some of the other uh, ant species that we see. Scientists believe that red imported fire ants first came to the United States sometime in the 1930s. Today, there are five times more red imported fire ants per acre in the U.S. than in their native rangeland in South America. And that's because the ants that call the United States home, you know, they've conveniently escaped their natural enemies that are in South America in their native range that work to suppress their populations and keep their populations in check. And so since they're free of that pressure, they're able to th thrive very well and very successfully in the southern landscape. And so these are images from the CDC, and you you can kind of see the distribution, the geographic region for um, red imported fire ants, mostly in the southern southeastern United States with limited geographic distribution in the states of New Mexico, Arizona, and California. As far as identification goes, fire ants are going to be small, you know, 1 16th to 1 5th inch in length. They have that two-tone coloration where they have that reddish head that transitions to a darker brown gaster. They have an aggressive disposition and will storm out of their mounds when their mound is disturbed. You can also see that they're polymorphic, and so you have little workers next to larger workers, and so you have a range of sizes with that worker cast in fire ants, okay? That little ant that you see pictured here, you know, next to one of the larger ones, that's as big as it's going to get. This is the adult form. So that little ant isn't going to continue to grow into a larger ant. It was just uh, designed to be a smaller or minor worker in the colony. Taking a closer look at the worker here, uh, one of the more prominent characteristics that we need to pay attention to when we're identifying ants is the number of nodes. And for red imported fire ants, they are a two node species. Nodes are the little bumps on the petiole or the thin waist between the thorax and the gaster, uh, which by the way, the gaster, that's the business end of a fire ant, that's where the stinger is. And fire ants, they can bite and they can sting. If you've ever been stung by one, you've probably seen them use their mouth parts to grab onto your skin, the arch their thorax, they'll curve in or curl in that gaster to deploy their stinger. 
And so I think it's important that we use the correct terminology as professionals. You know, biting is when an insect uses its mouth parts or its mandibles to break the skin. You know, commonly it's done to get a blood meal. So when we talk about mosquitoes or fleas or bed bugs, they pierce the skin to take a blood meal. And that is an example of an insect bite. A sting is where they're using another appendage, such as a stinger, to pierce the skin and inject venom. The two arrows are pointing to the two nodes on the fire ant petiole. Pretty distinct, pretty obvious that they have those two bumps there in between the thorax and gaster. Doxin Plus fire ant bait is also effective against fire ants because they find these granules so irresistible. This is a highly attractive food source to them. I took these pictures a couple months ago. A friend of mine had a dozen or more mounds in her yard, and I wanted to see how long it would take those foragers to find the granules. So I set out a piece of plywood and poured a little mound of granules on there and wanted to see how long it would take to find them. Now, I was a little skeptical because <laughs> it was close to lunchtime, so it was already starting to get towards midday and I wasn't quite sure how active these foragers were. And in less than an hour after placement, you can see that the, the ants were all over it. I took a little video of it too. You can see the workers collecting the granules. The little ones are carrying the smaller pieces, you know, the 0.84 millimeters, while those larger ones, they're carrying uh, um, those larger granules back to the colony. Hog heaven. So this is one of the many mounds I treated at that same yard. You can see I sprinkled the Doxin Plus fire ant bait around the mound. 24 hours later, I came back to observe the activity. Um, I had tried to attach a video so you could see the movement of the ants. It's kind of difficult to see because they blend in, but they were aggressively crawling up the stick. They were moving and uh, all around this opening and they weren't very happy that I stuck this stick through their home. But yeah, they were aggressively defending the mound when I poked it. So very, very, very much still an active mound 24 hours after application. 48 hours after application, I came back and there was zero activity in all the mounds that I treated. I dug into them deep to see if there were any survivors, any activity whatsoever. And I was very pleased to see the decimation. I did not come across a live fire ant. Again, Doxin Plus Fire Ant Bait is an effective option against big-headed ants as well. They're also on the label. This is another very successful group of ants found throughout the United States. There are native and invasive species that are commonly found both in urban and suburban landscapes, uh, and many that can be found encountered in the structure as well. These are ants that don't sting and they don't cause structural damage. You're not going to find them on that list of public health pests. As far as what they're feeding on, their food source consists of insects, both live and dead, seeds, and honeydew. You can see from the picture that the workers are going to be dimorphic. So they're going to come in either one of two sizes. The big one, that's the major worker. She's going to have that notably big noggin. And the workers that are, especially on the picture on the right side, you can see those smaller workers, the minor workers, you know, they're kind of normal size with normal shaped heads. Like fire ants, big headed ants also have two nodes. And you can see that very distinctly, especially the two pictures that are uh, the profile view. Unlike fire ants, they have two prominent spines on their thorax, and some species have more. You can see that um, big-headed ant species on the bottom left has very obvious multiple spines on the thorax. This product is also labeled for turf grass ants, and they can be a big nuisance on golf courses especially. These ants create mounds that are undesirable um, and become issues on turf grass where it's mowed very short. And so they can become an issue on tee boxes, greens, they're gonna interfere with putting, and they're gonna be unsightly. These are images from Michigan State University that show the appearance of these ants and the numerous small mounds that they create on the turf surface. Now these ants, they're of course living underground as deep as five feet below, and they're gonna make multiple exit points um, and mounds at the surface. And that's what we see here in the picture in the bottom right or the golf ball on the green. You can count you know, six or seven mounds there, uh, those exit points um, that the, the colony of their nest below had created. This, as far as identification goes, this is going to be a one-node species, unlike the big-headed ant and the fire ant that we saw before. Uh, they're going to be one eight inch in length, length and have that reddish-brown coloration. 
Pavement ants are monomorphic. This means that all ants are going to be the same size. It's different than what we saw previously. For instance, the you know, red imported fire ants, they're gonna be polymorphic, a lot of different sizes. Big headed ants, dimorphic, one of two sizes, either a major or a minor. And pavement ants, they're all going to be consistently the same size. And so they have that dark body coloration. Um, their legs are gonna be a lighter color and they're gonna have two nodes. And you can see that quite prominently between the thorax and the gaster there. Another really important feature for identification are the ridges or grooves that are very evident on the ant's head capsule as well as the thorax. Their colonies can get quite large, containing 10,000 or so individuals, um, and they can become a nuisance when they are creating their nests in between cracks, between pavers or sidewalks or in the pavement, or even when foragers come inside um, looking for food and structures. And so my colleague, Dr. Brittany Campbell, she recently had a pavement ant nest near her driveway. And you can see that pavement ant nest there uh, circled in the image on the right. Similar to what I did with the fire ants, she set out a small pile to observe the attractancy of Dachshund Plus fire ant bait against pavement ants. And within minutes, you can see those foragers didn't take much time at all to locate those bait granules and start taking them back to the nest. 15 hours later, she came back and you can see that uh, ceramic tile is wiped clean. All the bait had been collected and the ants were still alive. She was able to see that they were still actively foraging in that area around her driveway and out of the nest entrance. 48 hours later, all of the ants were dead. There was no more activity in and around the mound. They weren't seen moving around the driveway area. And so you can see like those little curled up ants around the nest entrance there. Uh, there was no more ant activity. And even though, you know, Dachshund Plus is called a fire ant bait, we can see that it's highly attractive and highly palatable to other ant species as well. All right, let's move along and talk about some other aspects of this label um, as far as, you know, directions for use. There are a few notable um, attributes about the Dachshund Plus label. One is that you can see here there is no signal word. As a manufacturer, we do have to submit tox data to the EPA, and that tox data is going to inform the degree of toxicity of the product. And it's only the pesticide products that are not required to display a signal word are going to be the ones that fall into that lowest toxicity category uh, deemed by the EPA through all routes of exposure. And so we have to understand and know what could happen if somebody gets exposed to this product, either through ingestion, oral, dermal, inhalation, if that product's breathed in, other effects like um, eyes, as well as skin sensitization, as well as irritation. And so that's a positive feature of this particular product, that there is no signal word. Uh, the other positive is that it's not a restricted use product, like some of the other fipronil granules that is registered for controlling fire ants, for instance, Taurus Trio G, that are only labeled and approved for use by certified applicators. The label does require the standard basic PPE for using Dachshund Plus, for handling it and applying it, that being long sleeve shirts, pants, uh, shoes, and socks. All right, now we're going to discuss where and how it can be applied. Outdoor applications can occur on both commercial turf grass, residential turf grass, and specific labeled sites include home lawns, golf courses, athletic fields, non or excuse me, recreational turf, non-grazed, non-crop areas, parks, cemeteries, picnic areas, uncultivated non-agricultural areas that includes things such as airports, roadsides, highway and utility right-of-ways, campgrounds and industrial sites to name a few, and then also institutional sites, which is defined as areas around properties, structures, or facilities providing service to public or private entities. Examples of institutional sites would include things like hospitals or nursing homes, schools, universities, colleges, museums, sports facilities, and office buildings. When broadcasting Dachshund Plus fire ant bait, the rate is going to be 1.5 pounds per acre or 0.5 ounces per thousand square feet. Now this product can be applied again after 14 days if needed. And 
excuse me, this is a SNP from the label where you see, you know, the rate per acre, the rate per thousand square feet. And there's also some additional, you know, directions when we're, when we're making those broadcast applications. I imagine many of us here are going to be familiar with how to calibrate equipment and spreaders to broadcast a bait granule, but it's likely that maybe we have some joining us that may not be as familiar with how to do that. So this is a quick how-to that Dr. Campbell created to share with us. And in this image, we see her measuring a known distance and marking that area with orange cones. She intends to treat that marked area, which was equivalent to 1,000 square feet. And so as we solve the application rate, she's going to need 0.5 ounces of bait to treat that 1,000 square feet. And you can see in these images, this is what that 0.5 ounces of Doxin Plus Fire Ant bait looks like in a clear container as well as in that hand spreader. After measuring that out, she put the bait in the spreader and she set it on the lowest setting and found the right pace to accurately cover that area. And so if you find out that you've uh, run out of bait before you covered the entire space or you still have product in the spreader after walking the entire space, you can adjust your speed or aperture setting. And this is a visual of how many granules th that will... Uh, on average kind of B per square foot. It's approximately 20 granules per square foot. Not much, but it does get the job done. You know, in that image to the right, we see those little bait granules circled there. Um, and I do wanna point out that, you know, applications to asphalt or impervious surface is not labeled, but this does give you a good visual about the, the spacing between individual granules when we're, we're doing a broadcast application. For mound treatments, the label calls for point five ounces per mound or approximately four level tablespoons. When treating mounds, Doxin Plus should be distributed uniformly around the mound. We don't want to put it directly on top of the mound, and we definitely don't want to disturb the mound either when we're doing these applications. Um, so as we briefly discussed, this bait can be applied through a spreader to coverage uh, you know, broadcast applications, or you can do it directly out of the, the jug, for instance. There is uh, application through the jug if you wanted to treat, you know, small areas or in individual mounds or with the, the tablespoons. And as we all know, like the back of our hands, the label is the law, and it's a violation of federal law to use products, pesticide products, in a manner, manner inconsistent with its labeling. And with that responsibility, it's important that we are really confident and sure of what the restrictions of, are. So it's it's important that we know how and where to apply it, but it's also arguably more important to understand uh, how you're not supposed to apply it and where you're not supposed to apply it. And we're going to get a lot of that information in the restriction section, right? And so this is a product that is only to be used outdoors. And when we're making applications of Doxin Plus, we want to make sure that there are no people, pets, or unprotected workers allowed in that treatment area during application. Doxin Plus is not approved for use on sod farms and do not allow uh, livestock or domestic animals to consume the bait. This product can be applied or can't be applied to impervious surfaces, such as sidewalks or driveways, as I mentioned. Do not make applications in the rain. And applicators have a limit for how much bait can be applied per calendar year. We can't exceed six pounds of Doxin Plus Fire Ant bait per acre per calendar year. And so there's, there's other um, restrictions, of course. So you definitely want to consult the label to understand what the full list of restrictions are when using this product. All righty. I'm going to plug along to the fun stuff, in my opinion. As a nerdy entomologist, I get excited when I get to talk about the research results. Let's see how this stuff performed in efficacy testing, both in the lab as well as in field conditions. Now, this is a trial uh, that was uh, a lab choice test where colony fragments that contained one queen, approximately 250 workers, and one milliliter of brood were offered Doxin Plus fire ant bait as well as an alternate food source. Because in natural settings in the environment, they're going to have competing food sources, right? And this bait really needs to stand up to that in those conditions. And the EPA does require that for a bait to be considered effective, it has to control 90% of the colony within 14 days. 
And so in this chart, what we're looking at on the y-axis, that vertical axis, we have percent mortality. And on the x-axis or horizontal axis, we're looking at days after treatment. And that purple line represents the results for doxamphirant bait. And you can see uh, we hit 90% of uh, mortality on the queens uh, by day 10. At, uh, 10 days after application and 100% mortality by day 12. When you take a look at that pink line that indicates that none of the queens that were in the control treatment had died during that 14 day, excuse me, trial period. So that was the queen results. Now what we're looking at are the results for the workers. Okay, Doxin Plus killed over 90% of the workers by day 10. But if you look at day two, look how many had died by day two. Almost 60% of all of those workers were dead by day two after application. This lab choice test dem demonstrated that Doxin Plus is an excellent option, provided excellent control of fire ant workers and queens. It started having a dramatic effect two days after application, resulting in 60% of the workers you know, already dead by day two, as we saw. And by day 10, all the queens, or excuse me, it was day 12, all the queens were dead. Less than 5% of the workers were, st were still hanging on um, by day 12. So this was a very similar design, uh, except for this time we compared Doxin Plus Fire Ant Bait to an industry standard. So something already in the market, something that uh, it was going to act as a positive control treatment. And so in these trials, you have a negative control, which is um, your treatments that received nothing. There is no insecticidal bait. You have Doxin Plus Fire Ant Bait, and then you have a positive control when you're using a product that you know you're going to get a good result from. And so we wanted to compare it to that positive control. And in this instance, we tested it against um, replicates that contained 300 fire ant workers. Unbelievable results for Doxin Plus, 300 fire ants per replicate, and check out that blue line, 90% of them dead by day two. The other bait took three times as long to cross that 90% mark. So both baits were very effective at killing all the ants within a week after application, but as we saw, Doxin Plus was uh, quite faster at eliminating the workers. All right, and the last and final data set that we're gonna look at was a field trial that was conducted in Florida. Uh, we have to use multiple field sites when we're doing these field trials. And Doxin Plus was evaluated both as a broadcast application as well as mound treatments. For the mound application evaluation, each plot had to contain 10 active fire ant mounds at the start of the study. Each mound was treated with that labeled 0.5 ounces of bait per mound. Original mounds as well as new mounds were counted and assessed for activity at various time points through 1 to 90 days following treatment. Broadcast applications also had to have plots that contained 10 active fire ant mounds at the start of the study. Plots were treated using the labeled rate of 0.5 ounces per thousand square feet. And observations again were made at those same time points between one and 90 days after treatment. Here's an illustration of the plots at one at site one, which was known as Bob White. And it contains treated and untreated uh, broadcast plots, as well as treated and untreated mound plots. And it's gonna be indicated by, you know, if you look at that key in the upper left-hand side, you'll see um, what those markings correlate to. And each plot had a 28 foot uh, buffer around it. And so um, these are requirements set by the EPA when designing these types of studies that they have to be so many feet apart from one another. What we're looking at here is field site number two, Lafayette Landing. Same thing, you have you know, broadcast and treated as well as broadcast treated plots. And we also have treated and untreated mound application plots in here. Now these charts are a little bit, uh, I would say a little slightly more complicated. There's a, a bit more going on. If you look at the y-axis on the left, number of mounds, okay, that's going to correlate to the purple bars. The y-axis on the right, that is percent control, okay, the percent reduction over time. So let's start off with those purple bars. Remember, on day one, we started with 10 active mounds, and after one week, it dropped to less than two active mounds on average per plot, with less than one mound on average from day 14 through 90 days. Now, from day 14 to 90 days, one application of Doxin Plus 
to existing mounds on the plot controlled the fire ants and stopped new mounds forming. So you can see that 90 to 100% control maintained over the course of 90 days. Same uh, type of chart here, but these are the results specifically for broadcast application. The previous graph was for mound applications. Looking at the purple bars, we can see the average number of active mounds. It drops from 10 to six by day three and less than two by one week. And from day 15 through day 90, we see 90 to 100% reduction in active mounds overall. This is really impressive long-term results that we're seeing both in mound and broadcast applications. All right, let's switch gears here from mounds to the effects to the active foragers in these given areas and plots. Following a mound treatment, we see 90 to 100% elimination of the foragers from one to four weeks post application. You see that kind of tapers off as we get closer to 90. And kind of similar trend here for the, uh, the foragers, the active foragers in these plots for broadcast treatment, a 95% reduction from weeks one to week two. So to wrap it up, Doxin Plus Fire Ant Bait is extremely palatable. We saw it's very attractive. We saw the videos for that in pictures. And after this data, we can see that it's very effective at controlling fire ants. Results show that this is a uh, faster acting and delivers long-term control uh, fire ant bait. 90-day season-long control of fire ants and really is going to be a product that you can count on to get the job done.